Hi everybody and welcome to our module on acute renal failure. Let's start by defining some important terms related to renal failure. When we say a patient has acute renal failure or acute kidney injury, sometimes called AKI, what we mean is that the patient has had an abrupt decrease in renal clearance that developed over a couple of hours or a couple of days. Acute renal failure is sometimes associated with symptoms, sometimes even at the outset of acute renal failure. And there are many causes which we'll talk about in this video, but most of them resolve. Most people who develop acute renal failure do not go on to have permanent kidney disease. In contrast, when we say a patient has chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure, we are referring to a slow, steady deterioration of renal function that occurs over years. I talk about chronic kidney disease in another video, but it's usually caused by diabetes or hypertension. Patients usually have no symptoms until they get to the most severe end stages, and this form of kidney disease is usually irreversible, and in most cases it's progressive, and patients eventually develop the need for dialysis. Some other terms related to acute renal failure are shown in this slide. So the word azot means nitrogen, so when a patient has azotemia, they have elevated levels of nitrogen-containing compounds in the blood, and the two important nitrogen-containing compounds in the blood are the BUN and the creatinine. This is the structure of creatinine shown on the screen here. It has nitrogen, and this is the structure of urea, which also has nitrogen. So any patient who has azotemia has high levels of BUN and creatinine, and this means the patient's kidneys are insufficiently filtering the blood. The term uremia technically means high levels of urea in the blood, but when we use the term uremia clinically, we use it to describe patients who have azotemia plus uremic symptoms. So really, uremia is a clinical syndrome consisting of symptoms related to poor renal function, and we'll talk about those symptoms in just a minute. And lastly, AKI can be categorized based on how much urine the kidneys are producing. In oliguric AKI, the kidneys are producing some urine, but less than normal. In non-oliguric AKI, the BUN and the creatinine rise, but there's no drop-off in urine production. And then lastly, in aneuric AKI, the kidneys are producing no urine. KDIGO stands for Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, and this is a group that recently came up with a series of clinical definitions for various features of acute kidney injury, so let's talk about those now. These things often come up on rounds in the hospital. So according to this group, the definition of acute kidney injury is one of three things, either an increase in creatinine more than 0.3 over 48 hours, or an increase in creatinine more than 1.5 times the baseline creatinine within the past seven days, or the presence of oliguria. And the definition of oliguria is urine output less than 0.5 milligrams per kilogram per hour. So on rounds, they'll ask you this, and your patient needs to have one of these three things present in order to carry a diagnosis of acute kidney injury. On this slide, I've listed some of the important symptoms of uremia. These include anorexia. Patients who are uremic often do not want to eat or drink. They complain of nausea and vomiting. The platelets become dysfunctional when the kidneys fail, and so therefore these patients are prone to bleeding. Uremic pericarditis can occur in some patients, and I talk about this in more detail in the cardiology video on pericardial disease. Asterixis is a flapping of the hands when you ask the patient to stretch their arms out straight. This can be seen in uremia. And then finally, many patients with uremia are simply confused, and that's because they develop encephalopathy. Now, even though all these symptoms can happen in patients with acute renal failure, you should know that most patients who have AKI are asymptomatic. Usually, AKI is detected on routine blood work, and there really are no history or physical exam findings that are very specific to indicate that a patient may have acute renal failure. The two most important labs to identify patients with acute renal failure are measurement of the serum creatinine and the serum BUN. Creatinine is freely filtered by the glomerulus, and there's a small amount of secretion by tubular epithelial cells. BUN is also freely filtered, however, it is reabsorbed when the kidneys are trying to hold on to water. In acute renal failure, both of these will rise because in acute renal failure, there's less filtering of the blood. However, if the reason the kidneys are filtering less blood is because they are underperfused, then the BUN will rise more. That's because less will be filtered and more will be reabsorbed. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail in a few slides, but I just want to point this out here because this is a major point of the diagnosis of acute renal failure is that if the cause of acute renal failure is under perfusion of the kidneys, then the creatinine will rise, but the BUN will rise even more, and that's because it will get reabsorbed along with water. The most important thing to understand about acute renal failure for your boards and for your clinical rotations is how to figure out what is causing the acute renal failure. And you can basically break down the causes of acute renal failure into three categories. The first category is called pre-renal failure, and this is the majority of cases, almost three-quarters of cases of acute renal failure are due to pre-renal failure. 
And pre-renal failure is caused by insufficient blood flow to the kidneys. This could be because of volume depletion or shock or heart failure. For many, many reasons, patients often do not deliver enough blood flow to the kidneys. And when that happens, the pre-renal form of acute renal failure will develop. In this form of renal failure, the kidneys are fine. The problem is simply that they are not getting enough blood flow. The least common type of acute renal failure is called post-renal. This is a very small minority of cases. And this happens when there's obstruction of urine outflow from the kidneys. To develop renal failure, meaning a rise in the BUN and creatinine from an obstruction to urinary outflow, you need to have bilateral obstruction. If just one kidney is obstructed, the other kidney will handle the load, and the BUN and creatinine usually do not rise. So things that can obstruct the outflow of both kidneys are things like kidney stones that find their way into the bladder, prosthetic hypertrophy in men, tumors, and congenital anomalies. The most common reason you will see this is because a patient is unable to void for some reason, and therefore urine backs up from their bladder into the kidneys, causing post-renal acute renal failure. And then in the middle, in terms of frequency, is intrinsic renal failure. This is a little less than half of cases. This refers to things that involve the kidney itself, so diseases like acute tubular necrosis, glomerular nephritis. In intrinsic renal failure, there's some disease process of the kidneys themselves that are causing the BUN and creatinine to rise. So we'll talk about how to identify the three different types of acute renal failure by going through each type one at a time. And we'll start by talking about pre-renal failure. Remember, this is the most common cause of acute kidney injury. In pre-renal failure, there's decreased blood flow to the kidneys, as we have already discussed. This means that less BUN and creatinine are filtered, and therefore the serum levels of BUN and creatinine are going to rise in the blood. In response to less blood flow, the kidneys will begin reabsorbing more water, and when they reabsorb more water, they will reabsorb more BUN with the water. For this reason, although both the BUN and creatinine rise, the BUN will rise much more than the creatinine does. And as a result, when you look at the serum levels of BUN and creatinine in a patient with pre-renal failure, the creatinine will be up, but the BUN will be up a lot more. And because BUN is up more than creatinine, the ratio of BUN and creatinine will also rise. If they go up by the same amount, the ratio does not change that much. But when BUN goes up a lot more than creatinine, you get a rise in the BUN and creatinine ratio. The biggest challenge in making a diagnosis of pre-renal failure is distinguishing pre-renal failure from intrinsic renal failure, which we'll talk about later. And the three metrics I've shown on this slide are very useful for identifying pre-renal failure and distinguishing it from intrinsic renal failure. The first one is the urinary concentration of sodium. This varies based on intake of sodium and water in the diet, but it gets very low when the kidneys are retaining salt and water in pre-renal failure. And a value of less than 20 is considered low, and this is what you expect in pre-renal failure. This is not what you see in intrinsic renal failure. The fractional excretion of sodium is a number you can calculate from the formula shown on the screen. It's equal to the plasma creatinine times the urinary sodium concentration, divided by the plasma sodium concentration times the urinary creatinine concentration. So if you have these four values, you can calculate the fractional excretion of sodium, otherwise known as the phena. And this is the amount of filtered sodium that is excreted in the urine, and this amount gets very low when the kidneys are retaining salt and water in pre-renal failure, and less than 1% is low, and this is the value you expect in pre-renal failure. And then finally, the urinary osmolarity is a measure of the concentrating ability of the kidneys, the ability of the kidneys to reabsorb water. So the urinary osmolarity should be high when the kidneys are retaining water, and that's what happens in pre-renal failure. And urinary osmolarity can range from as low as 50 to as high as 1,200, but in pre-renal failure, the value is usually high, greater than 500, towards the higher end of the range. And then lastly, one super high yield point that you need to know for rounds is that sodium measurements in the urine are not useful in patients on diuretics. So in any patient taking a diuretic, especially a loop diuretic, the urinary sodium is going to be high and the fractional excretion of sodium is also going to be high, but that has nothing to do with the kidneys and the degree of renal failure and it has everything to do with the diuretics. So you can't use these first two measurements in patients who are taking diuretics. They won't be accurate. So on this slide, I've summarized the expected urinary findings in a patient with pre-renal failure. And remember, the idea here is that the kidneys are reabsorbing lots of water and sodium. So for this reason, the urine will be concentrated and the urinary osmolarity will be high. Because sodium is being pulled from the urine, there will be low sodium excretion. And this will be reflected by a low urinary sodium concentration and a low phena. And then lastly, patients with pre-renal failure have what's known as a bland urinary sediment. This means there's no protein in the urine, no cells. There usually are no casts, although there's one special type of cast you can see in pre-renal failure. It's called a hyaline cast. This occurs anytime patients are volume depleted. But outside of hyaline casts, there should be no other casts. 
And remember that protein in the urine and cells and casts, these all suggest injury to the glomerulus, and the glomerulus is fine and healthy in patients with prerenal failure. So here's a summary of the expected laboratory findings in a patient with prerenal failure. So the BUN can go up by as much as a factor of 3, in this example from 20 to 60. The creatinine also rises, but not to the same degree, in this example it goes from 1 to 2. The normal ratio of BUN to creatinine is 20 to 1, but it gets higher in prerenal failure because, as we said before, the BUN goes up by more than the creatinine. Urinary sodium, phena, and urinary osmolarity are all variable in the normal state depending on how much sodium and water you are taking in in your diet. But in a patient with prerenal failure, you should have a low urinary sodium, a low phena, and a high urinary osmolarity. There are lots of causes of prerenal failure. I've listed some of the important ones on the slide here. A patient who is hypotensive for any reason will underperfuse the kidneys. This could be from sepsis, this could be from bleeding, this could be from anaphylaxis. If the hypotension is severe, that can lead to intrinsic kidney damage, but if the hypotension is mild, it will just lead to underperfusion of the kidneys and prerenal failure. Hypovolemia can also cause prerenal failure if patients are volume depleted from diuretics or from fluid loss due to burns, for example those patients will underperfuse the kidneys. Once again, severe hypovolemia can cause intrinsic renal damage, but more moderate degrees of hypovolemia will cause prerenal failure. If there's a stenosis in the renal artery, that can cause prerenal failure that will underperfuse the kidneys. And then two drugs that are sort of classic causes of prerenal failure are NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors. So if you look at this slide on the screen here, this is a glomerulus, and this is the afferent arterial and the efferent arterial. When you give NSAIDs, you constrict the afferent arterial, so that cuts off blood flow to the kidneys, and therefore prerenal failure can develop. When you give ACE inhibitors, you dilate the efferent arterial, and that causes more blood to flow past the kidneys rather than going into the glomerulus and getting filtered. This has a similar effect to NSAIDs in that there is less perfusion of the kidneys, less GFR, and therefore prerenal failure can occur. Patients who have heart failure or liver disease can develop a type of renal failure that looks just like prerenal failure, but it's a little bit different. In patients with heart failure, this is called development of a cardiorenal syndrome. In patients with liver disease like cirrhosis, this is called a hepatorenal syndrome. In both of these cases, patients can develop renal failure with some prerenal features. They often have low urinary sodium. Sometimes the BUN and creatinine can rise in a similar manner to the way they rise in prerenal failure. In addition, normally the urinalysis is normal or bland with no protein and no or very few red or white cells. The main feature that distinguishes cardiorenal and hepatorenal syndromes from prerenal failure is that these syndromes do not respond to fluid administration. If you give normal saline or lactated ringers to a patient who is prerenal, usually that patient's kidney function gets better because you improve blood flow to the kidneys. In these patients, more fluid does not help, and that's what defines the cardiorenal and hepatorenal syndromes. The treatment for these forms of renal failure is usually to treat the underlying condition, resolve the heart failure, or resolve the cirrhosis. Moving on, now let's talk about post-renal failure. So in post-renal failure, there's no problem with the kidneys themselves. The problem is that there's an obstruction to the outflow of urine through the urinary tract. As a result, urine backs up and there are high pressures in the tubules of the nephron. This causes the kidneys to be unable to filter the blood. In addition, the resorptive mechanisms of the kidneys don't work either. They're damaged or destroyed. So all of this works together to cause the BUN and creatinine to rise and for renal failure to develop. On this slide, I've shown some selected causes of post-renal failure. One of the most common is prostate enlargement among men, which is shown in this image on the screen. When the prostate becomes enlarged, urine has difficulty leaving the bladder. That can cause urine to back up into the bladder and the ureters and ultimately into the kidneys. The same thing can happen in men who have prostate cancer. Stones can form and obstruct the ureters, and if both ureters are obstructed or if outflow out of the bladder is obstructed by a bladder stone, this can lead to post-renal failure. Neurogenic bladder is when some form of central or peripheral nerve damage causes the patient to be unable to empty the bladder, and this will cause post-renal failure. And finally, there are a number of medications which blunt the ability for patients to void, and when patients are on these drugs, they're unable to void, the bladder fills up, and urine can back up into the kidneys, causing post-renal failure. Anticholinergic drugs like atropine are sort of the classic group of drugs to do this, but this often occurs as well in patients who are on sedatives or patients who have received anesthesia. One of the key clinical features of post-renal failure is anuria. You can have anuric renal failure from pre-renal and intrinsic renal causes, but there's almost always anuria when a patient has post-renal failure. The test of choice for diagnosis of post-renal failure is an ultrasound. You can do a bladder ultrasound. This is often available at the bedside. Nurses can scan the bladder, and if there's a large volume of urine trapped in the bladder, that implies a bladder outlet obstruction is the cause of renal failure. 
You can also do a renal ultrasound in cases of post-renal failure. This will show bilateral hydronephrosis. That's what's shown in this image on the screen here. You can also see hydroureter, which means a swollen ureter. And so in cases of acute kidney injury of unknown cause, an ultrasound, either of the bladder or the kidneys, is almost always the first step. That's because before you go working up pre and intrinsic renal failure, you want to quickly exclude post renal failure with an ultrasound. Another thing you can do to evaluate post renal failure is a urinary catheterization. If you insert a catheter into the bladder and you drain a large volume of urine, this implies that the patient has a bladder outlet obstruction. This is both diagnostic and therapeutic because not only does it make the diagnosis of outlet obstruction, it also relieves the bladder outlet obstruction. In post-renal failure, the BUN and the creatinine will rise, but there's lots of variability in how much they will rise. You may remember that for pre-renal failure, I told you that the ratio of BUN and creatinine becomes greater than 20 to 1. There isn't anything like that that you can rely on for post-renal failure, and that's because there's lots of variation in the lab values based on what the tubules of the nephron are doing. Early in post-renal failure, the tubular function can be intact, and this can cause the kidneys to reabsorb lots of BUN and potentially cause a high BUN to creatinine ratio. Later in post-renal failure, the high pressure in the tubules can disrupt reabsorption, and then you may not see as high a ratio of BUN and creatinine. So the bottom line is that the urine chemistries are variable, and you won't make the diagnosis of post-renal failure based on the pattern of BUN and creatinine elevation. The way you make the diagnosis of post-renal failure is through an ultrasound that shows hydronephrosis or hydroureter, and that's why ordering a renal ultrasound is always part of the workup for patients who have renal failure of unknown cause. You want to do that right away and exclude post-renal failure, and then from there you can go on and do other testing to determine whether the patient has pre-renal failure or intrinsic renal failure. Okay, so now we've talked about pre-renal failure and post-renal failure. Let's finish by talking about intrinsic renal failure. So in this form of renal failure, the problem lies within the kidney itself. There's some problem with the nephrons and the tubules, and the kidneys are unable to filter blood normally. As a result, less BUN and creatinine will be filtered, and there will be rising BUN and creatinine in the blood. So just like in all forms of renal failure, the BUN and the creatinine rise. In contrast to pre-renal failure, however, in intrinsic renal failure, there's no extra rise in the BUN from more resorption. And as a result, there will be a normal ratio of BUN and creatinine of 20 to 1. The ratio will not increase the way it does in pre-renal failure. The urinary findings in intrinsic renal failure are very helpful for distinguishing intrinsic problems from pre-renal failure. And to understand the urinary findings in intrinsic renal failure, you need to remember that the kidneys cannot reabsorb water and sodium normally. For this reason, the urinary osmolarity will not be high like it is in pre-renal failure. That's because the kidneys can't concentrate the urine. The urinary sodium is going to be high. That's because the kidneys can't reabsorb sodium and pull it from the urine. By the same logic, the fractional excretion of sodium is high because the kidneys can't pull sodium from the urine. And these three things here are all the opposite of what you find in pre-renal failure. And then finally, in intrinsic renal failure, there's often an abnormal sediment. So things like protein, red and white cells, and casts, these can all be present in the urine with intrinsic renal failure. You do not see these things in the urine with pre-renal failure. So here's a table showing you the type of lab values you could see in a patient with intrinsic renal failure. So normal BUN and creatinine are 20 and 1. In intrinsic renal failure, they might be 40 and 2. They're both elevated, but the ratio is still 20 to 1. The ratio did not go up the way it did in pre-renal failure. And remember, it's easy to identify post-renal failure. You just order an ultrasound. So really, when you're working up renal failure of unknown cause, the major challenge is to distinguish intrinsic from pre-renal failure. And one of the ways you can do that is by looking at the pattern of BUN and creatinine elevation. The other way you can do that is by looking at the urinary sodium, the phena, and the urinary osmolarity. So in pre-renal failure, like we talked about before, the urinary sodium and the phena are going to be very low. Those will not be low in intrinsic renal failure because the kidneys can't pull sodium from the urine. So you will have a higher urinary sodium, and greater than 40 is considered high, and the phena will not be very low under 1% like it was in pre-renal. It will usually be 2% or higher. And then in pre-renal failure, the urinary osmolarity was high, greater than 500. That's because the urine is being concentrated as the kidneys try to hang on to water. In intrinsic renal failure, that won't happen, and the urinary osmolarity will be low, usually less than 350. Remember, the osmolarity of plasma is 285. So if the osmolarity of urine is 285, that means the kidneys are doing nothing to dilute or concentrate the urine. And in intrinsic renal failure, you usually get an osmolarity closer to that of plasma because the kidneys just aren't able to either pull water from the urine or to dump water into the urine. They're just not doing much, and the osmolarity comes out close to that of plasma. 
There are lots and lots of causes of intrinsic renal failure, but the most common is acute tubular necrosis. This is a disorder I discuss in the video on tubular interstitial disorders. And acute tubular necrosis has many causes, including ischemia and toxins and many other things. But one thing you should be aware of is acute tubular necrosis can occur due to underperfusion, which initially causes pre-renal failure. And then as it becomes more severe, kidney cells begin to die and the pre-renal failure converts to ATN, which is a form of intrinsic renal failure. Other common causes of intrinsic renal failure are toxins. Many of these toxins actually cause acute tubular necrosis, or sometimes they cause other forms of renal injury. In the hospital, you will commonly see intrinsic renal failure from radiocontrast dyes. These are agents that are used as part of obtaining a CT scan. We talked earlier about how NSAIDs can cause pre-renal failure, but they can also cause intrinsic renal failure. Cisplatin is a drug used for chemotherapy. Amphotericin is an antifungal agent and cyclosporin is an immunosuppressant, and all of these can cause intrinsic renal failure, along with many, many other drugs. So in real life, it is sometimes hard to classify patients' renal failure as being purely due to pre-renal failure, intrinsic, or post-renal failure. One of the reasons for this is because a lot of diseases cross the boundaries. For example, we just talked about how patients can initially have pre-renal failure, which can progress to cause acute tubular necrosis and intrinsic renal failure. In addition, lots of patients in the hospital and even outside the hospital are taking diuretics, and this obscures the urinary findings, making it hard to make a diagnosis of pre- or intrinsic renal failure. And then lastly, lots of patients have pre-existing chronic renal disease. So in these patients, they don't develop pure pre-renal failure or pure intrinsic renal failure. They develop some form of acute renal failure on top of chronic kidney disease, and that makes it harder to make pure delineations. Let's talk about the management of acute renal failure. So for patients who have pre or post renal failure, their kidneys are healthy. The problem is that either the kidneys are underperfused or there's an obstruction to urinary flow. So for these patients, the goal of treatment is to correct the underlying cause so the kidneys can do their job. So for example, in patients who are volume depleted, you want to treat the volume depletion. In patients with heart failure, you want to improve the heart failure. If a patient has a ureteral obstruction or they can't empty their bladder, you want to fix that problem and then the renal failure will get better. Outside of these things, there really aren't specific treatments for acute renal failure. Mostly you monitor the patients, and we'll talk about how you monitor them in a few slides, to see if they develop an indication for dialysis. If they do not, you usually wait and the renal function improves over time. Like we said at the beginning of this video, most patients with acute renal failure will have recovery of renal function. One other piece of the management for any patient with acute renal failure is you want to stop or hold all drugs that can affect renal function. So this includes drugs like diuretics, ACE inhibitors and ARBs and NSAIDs. You don't want to give these to patients with acute renal failure unless you have to. If these drugs can be safely discontinued, you should do that because that will allow the kidneys to recover more rapidly. And then one special side note, this is super high yield for your boards, is patients who are on the diabetes drug metformin have a risk of developing lactic acidosis in the setting of acute renal failure. So you always want to stop metformin in a diabetic patient who comes in the hospital and develops acute renal failure. Shown on this slide are the indications for dialysis, which most people remember by the mnemonic AEIOU. The A is for acidemia. The E is for electrolytes, which usually means hyperkalemia, but it can also be other electrolytes like magnesium. The I is for intoxication. This refers to an overdose of a dialyzable substance. O is for overload of fluid. This means congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema. And the U is for uremic symptoms. And I've bolded electrolytes and overload of fluid because these are the most common reasons that patients require dialysis. And then lastly, always remember that if one of these things is going to be an indication for dialysis, it must be refractory to medical therapy. Obviously, we wouldn't dialyze someone if their electrolyte disorder can respond to medical treatment. Same is true for heart failure. If you can treat the heart failure without dialysis, that's the way you should do it. So when you're faced with a patient that has AKI of unclear etiology, let's go through some of the key elements that you should include in your evaluation. The first one is the history and physical exam. You want to know if the patient has an established history of heart failure or cirrhosis, and you want to examine them to see if they are volume depleted or volume overloaded. You always want to do a medication review because as we've been talking about in this video, many medications can cause acute kidney injury. And you want to identify the baseline creatinine. A patient who has an increased creatinine that was normal a week ago is very different from a patient who has had an increased creatinine over the last three years. Remember what I told you earlier, an AKI of unclear etiology, a bladder or renal ultrasound is usually the first step in order to exclude a bladder outlet obstruction. Your analysis can be helpful in evaluating AKI of unclear etiology. A bland urinalysis is a urinalysis with no casts and few cells. 
and this implies that pre-renal failure is the diagnosis. If you see casts and cells in protein, that implies an intrinsic renal cause. And then earlier we talked about how you can use the urinary sodium, the urinary osmolarity, and the phena to distinguish pre-renal failure from intrinsic renal failure. And in order to calculate the phena, you need all the elements of this equation on the screen. These are the serum sodium and creatinine and the urine sodium and creatinine. And then remember what I said earlier, for patients taking diuretics, especially loop diuretics, the phena and the urinary sodium are not going to be useful. And I'll finish with this slide and talk about the standard monitoring that's done in the hospital for patients that have acute renal failure. First of all, you want to monitor their BUN and creatinine every day. You want to weigh them every day because if their weight is going up, this suggests retention of fluid. On the other hand, if their weight is declining, it suggests that they are making lots of urine and fluid is being removed. It's standard to record the ins and outs. This is the total volume of fluid that the patient is given, either orally or as intravenous medications, and the total amount of fluid that goes out in the urine. The blood pressure should be monitored throughout the day, and lastly, the electrolytes are always monitored because, as we've discussed, hyperkalemia is an indication for dialysis. And that concludes our module on acute renal failure.